All right, here we go. The Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt is funded by patrons like you and me. Each month, I pledge one dollar. Being British, I had no idea what a dollar was, so I stayed up for hours researching and discovered that it is about 62 pence. To pledge 62p, or perhaps even more, go to patreon.com slash acedetect. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 29th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Darren Kitchen, founder of Hack5.org. How are you, DK? I feel so good to be here, Tom. I'm very excited about today's show, and it's cool to be using technology again. Yeah, you spent a week at a camp deto- digitally detoxing. You are you are mellowed out, man. I am. I am. And now I miss my Apple Newton and all of my old tech. I feel like I need <laughs> wow, to they wiped get his on memory a too. program of getting back in the groove. So maybe I find my old Palm Pilot, maybe my right. HP iPack, one by one. Know, man. You might want to start with Windows 286 and some DOS. Just yeah, DOS shell is so you don't have the digital bends. Mm. <laughs> You know, Len's here as well. Yeah, Len Peralta is here. He has not been detoxing digitally. How's it going, Len Peralta? Oh, I've, um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Go Cavs. Uh, yeah, but yes, yet you're wearing a baseball. Shirt. I know. I, they're, they're calling me right now about that. I, yeah, the Cavs very, are calling Dan Len. Upset. Uh, sir, you're not representing us properly wearing an Indian shirt. Don't do that. Uh, so Len's going to be illustrating the show as he always does. Well, they're going to be talking a little bit about a former North Korean computer science professor who has defected to South Korea and is now warning us that 6,000 North Korean hackers could destroy a whole city. Uh, Darren and I will evaluate those claims after the headlines. Apple posted its recommended workaround for the iPhone messages bug, according to The Verge. The support document directs iPhone users to reply to any malicious messages using Siri. Apple's also working on a fix. Bug is also affecting iOS users of Twitter and Snapchat who have notifications on for those services. With Twitter, it just crashes your phone, doesn't cause any lasting damage. With Snapchat, it makes the chat history with the sender inaccessible seemingly permanently. I'm sure somebody will figure out a workaround to that. It doesn't affect the rest of Snapchat, though. You just, it's kind of a joke on the person who sent it because you can no longer communicate with that person. You know, I'm, What I'm most disappointed at, and and I actually, I must say, I must give credit to Apple first and that I love their workaround. It's like, oh, yeah, you just have to use Siri and and coax it into, you know, doing this thing and reading this message for you. It's almost the you're holding it wrong. I love it. Um, But I'm I'm really disappointed that the Unicode characters that create this are not the table flip guy, and I feel like that's a lost opportunity. It really is, although... Uh, it, the fact is that, it, as far as I understand it, Darren, and I know you researched this for ThreatWire, so maybe you know a little more about it, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's the fact that there are too many unusual characters for the notifications uh, process to handle them, which causes the problems. So could you just do a whole lot of table flip, guys, and get the same effect? You know, you might be able to. Uh, it comes down to Cortex is the engine that actually parses those and creates the lines and paragraphs. And uh, I, I guess it's actually used by not just the iPhone, but the iPad, the uh, Apple Watch, as well as even uh, OS X, but only in the terminal. Mm-hmm. And so it's the way that it's implemented uh, specifically on the iPhones uh, to the notifications. So if you don't have home screen notifications or, or I guess, lock screen notifications turned on, you'll never have this experience. So that's a good workaround for right now until Apple does issue a fix. And it, yeah, it it does make you wonder like, you know, what other characters could you spam to the notification area where it wouldn't know how to handle them? Yeah, I mean, enough table flip guys will make anybody upset, to be honest. PC World reports on Google's announcement that Levi's, yeah, the gene makers are the first partner for a smart fabric called Project Jacquard, spelled J-A-C-Q-U-A-R-D. The experiment weaves electronics into cloth to create the equivalent of touchscreen controls. So the demos they're doing at Google I.O. show fabric that manipulates a 3D image on a display, changes the songs on a phone, you know, skips forward, et cetera, and uh, even controls the lights. You can turn your lights off and on. It's Think of it like a mouse in your pants. Wait. Yeah. No, I love it. I mean, you know, it's a great thing that uh, Google has really partnered with a true innovator in the pants arena. Um, I mean, Levi Strauss really innovated denim jeans 
uh, as far back as 1853. Sure, rivets. Uh, they were known for their, their massive innovation in using rivets. Um, there used to, in fact, be a rivet in the crotch area, which has since been removed because mm, the thankfully. founder sat a little too close to a campfire, and it turns out those things get hot. Mm. Um, but, yeah, no, so this is another such innovation. So, I mean, it may have been, you know, 150 years coming, but I'm looking forward to the next big thing from Levi's. Reuters reports Path sold some of its apps to South Korea's Dom Kakao. They are the makers of Kakao Talk. If you're making the remark, who uses Path anymore? You, sir or madam, just gave yourself away as not being Indonesian. Instant data mining. I know who you are now. In any case, the makers of Kakao Talk didn't get all of Path, just the social network and Path Messenger. Path Places, which a lot of people liked, uh, and enabled connections between customers and businesses like restaurants, stayed with Path, though it has been disabled for the time being. And Path says they don't have a way to invest in a new app for it to live in. Path has also been developing non-Path branded apps like GIF creation app Kong. I'm just wondering, like, where do where do social networks go to die? Indonesia. Indonesia. What? <laughs> Apparently, that's what the reason Kakao, because Kakao Talk is the biggest messenger in South Korea. The reason Kakao bought Path is they wanted to get into the Indonesian market, and apparently, Path is huge in Indonesia. That's cool. Yeah. A report from the Washington Post cites a new report from the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that says digital security is essential freedom of ex is essential for freedom of expression and warns that weakening encryption in some countries could undermine that freedom worldwide. The report was written by Special Rapporteur David Kay. He's also the director of the International Justice Clinic at the University of California, Irvine. Kay wrote that governments, quote, should avoid all measures that weaken the security that individuals may enjoy online, such as backdoors, weak encryption standards, and key escrows, because it results in weaker security for everyone. This is epic. I, I love this. I, I love this as much as I love all of the other amazing things that are written out in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, it really speaks to me as a as a human, <laughs> and I think that uh, you know we would all say like yes, this is a good thing. And it's it's really upsetting when you see all of the amazing stuff that is said by the United Nations, all of the you know these proposals and all of these you know papers and and and, um, and then you see what actually happens, and it's like that discrepancy that's really heartbreaking. Uh, so I hope that this. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any teeth, but um, I hope it can be used to, you know, wave the flag um, mm -hmm. and maybe get something that does have teeth. It is a, it's a very well-written reasoning of mm -hmm. why uh, weakening encryption, even with escrow keys, uh, is a bad idea. And, and you may still be for it. I know there are some people who are, but I would highly encourage you to read this, even if you are for it, because this may help you come up with better arguments of why it is important to weaken encryption. I personally don't think that we should weaken encryption, and my reasons run right alongside of this. I think what's impressive about it is this person is a legal scholar, an international law scholar, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, you know, and no surprise that legal scholars are good at arguing, but was able to really show that he understood the nature of encryption as well, which is a really difficult topic uh, that even security researchers can get wrong sometimes. Well, it's just nice that we'll be able to have like, you know, such a representative source to, to cite, mm. um, you know, in that argument that, you know, it's not a good idea to weaken encryption. You know, you got to take the good with the bad to move yeah. forward. TechCrunch reports that Apple acquired augmented reality startup Mateo on May 22nd. It's M-E-T-A-I-O. The company launched back in 2003 as an offshoot of a project of Volkswagen, of all places. 9 to Find Max, Mark Gurman, who has good sources, believes that Apple is working on an augmented reality feature for its Maps app. And this would bear out that they're at least working on augmented reality for something. And, of course, there's that VR headset that Apple patented earlier this year. Of course, they patent a lot of things that don't end up turning into products, but uh, it definitely seems like Apple's trying to get into either AR, VR, or both in some way down the road. Yeah, I would be surprised if they weren't. Really. Yeah, kind of like, makes sense that they would. The Verge reports the welcome news that you can finally use GIFs on Facebook, mostly. If you drop a link to a GIF, which has already been uploaded elsewhere on the internet, the GIF will appear. Uploading a GIF directly to Facebook doesn't seem to work just yet. 
Yeah, um, we we may we may know someone actually that might have made this happen uh, personally. Is that and right? It's, it's actually really cool that the, te the technology that works on the back end. The the reason why it's such a long time coming is because GIFs are inherently terrible at data compression, and some GIFs will actually be they're just massive in size for what they're actually animating. So on the back end, what will happen is it'll ingest the GIF and then create a version of the GIF that's actually using HTML5 to play it back. But if you still want to, you can right-click and save it, and then it will serve up the actual GIF. So you can save that GIF to your desktop. And, so the whole trick, because I know there's probably some, some old school folks who are like, you just show the image, right? What's so hard, Facebook? Yeah. But what you're saying is they're trying to make sure that they use the same compression that keeps their service light, especially on mobile, for people. And, and this has, has been able to not lose an animated GIF because if you, if, you anim, if you compress it wrong, you lose the animation. Uh, cool. So, yeah, that, that is a nifty trick there. That's really cool. Right. And it's, it's really weird that when you think about what's happened is there's a massive technological workaround being done to use the latest and greatest video compression technologies for one of the oldest on the Internet because we just can't let it go. Uh, I think it says a lot about the culture of the internet and yeah. so I think that the GIF is just an amazing thing in that right. And Gadget reports that Google is broadening out its Google sign-in feature with Smart Lock for Passwords. In a Google developer's blog post, Smart Lock for Passwords is described as a frictionless method for users to sign into apps on Android and on sites in Chrome. Smart Lock works a bit like a password locker. Uh, once a user saves a password to Smart Lock, they can then skip entering those credentials on any authenticated instance of Chrome or Android devices. For instance, Netflix is a partner in this. So if I sign into Netflix on my Chrome browser, save that login, that authentication to Smart Lock, then I could go to Android TV, where I'm logged in as, as my, with my Google account, launch Netflix, and it would say, oh, okay, you're, you're logged in already, and I don't have to go through all that on-screen mess to log in again. Well, it sounds like it makes life really convenient. And from what I understand about security and convenience is that they're not always hand in hand. I was worried um, you were going to point that out. <laughs> credit because they're usually pretty innovative when it comes to security. You know, being one of the first to roll out uh, two-factor authentication and things of that nature. But I don't know. I've I, I got to ask you, uh, Tom, do you use a password manager? I do, yes. Okay. Do you? Uh, would, would you use a Google password manager? No. I don't know. I might for something like this. Look, I, I'm sure that Google is going to great going to go going to go to great lengths to demonstrate to people how secure this is. I wouldn't store my passwords from a bank in there. I'm just saying. Uh, my Netflix account, may, I might that might be an acceptable risk. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I just can't use. Now it. I'm I starting to. The, the, just you. Just your tone of voice is making me rethink my position on that. Like, okay, what... Well, what there's not a wrong those? opinion, Tom. Yeah, there's I know, just, I know. You know. Everyone else's and then yours as the outlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so you're, you're just like, no. I, I wouldn't would do it. I would but never give again, my data. I don't use any password manager, so... And that's because you believe that password manager gives you a single point of failure, and if somebody hacks into that, you lose everything, right? Exactly. So, what, so what's the solution for somebody who's like, I am not going to try to remember all my passwords... Oh, um, well, <laughs> unfortunately, password reset functions are so terribly uh, built that it all really just hinges on your email anyway. So when you think of it that way, right, if I can just, uh, using Netflix as an example, if ultimately if I want to reset your Netflix and get, you know, I guess not get your password, but change your Netflix password so I can, you know, log in and see your movies and find out you're a closet brony or whatever, I right. can just do that by hacking your email, right? And then resetting your Netflix password. And the same goes for most other services. They fall back on your email. So when you've already accepted the fact that the single point of failure is already your email, and a lot of people use Google, Gmail as their inbox, um, then I guess it's not too much of a stretch to say, well, I'm already in that boat. Um, but I guess I'm just not ready to commit all the way to that but what do, you, knowing, what do you do to manage your passwords then? Oh, I just remember a different password, and if I forget it, I just reset it. You just reset it. Okay. Yeah. I use a lot of um, – uh, my secret is the who is uh, record database for domains. There's unique information in each of these, which can be used as a seed 
And sometimes, depending on the level of stuff, you may have to run it through an MD5 to get a checksum and use an offset. Anyway, there's there's a lot of tricks where you can come up with a memorable, or not memorable, I'm sorry, a non-memorable but very easily remembered password. Mm -hmm. That didn't make any sense. The problem, the problem I have with that, uh, the, the thing I worry about with that is if somebody gets a couple of my passwords, mm. right? And this is an edge case, I'll admit. Yes, but if somebody right. were to get a couple of my passwords, they might be able to figure out my method. Sure. No, if there's a pattern, absolutely. You're right. And, you know, um, I don't have a good defense yeah. against that, except for the fact that the pattern seems very random considering I use like hashing algorithms and seed data sure. from static sources. That well, are it's, it's all about speed bumps, right? You're throwing a lot of speed bumps in the way of somebody who really wants to, to get at it. The, the, I'm not low-hanging fruit. We'll the, honestly, the thing is get rid of passwords. Let's exactly. I think they're terrible. I, I don't, I'm not saying that I know what the, the better solution is, but they are pretty terrible. And Google has a lot going on at I.O. about replacements for passwords and, and things like that. They're part of the FIDO well, alliance. Well, you know, I don't think that the first solution we're going to see is the best. And I think we're going to see a lot of solutions offered from a lot of big companies. Uh, but, you know, regardless, the big takeaway there is that uh, this is on our minds. It's something that we've all acknowledged is a terrible, uh, you know, part of the web. And unlike GIFs, it should die. All right. Uh, what should not die is your participation in the subreddit. Thank you to everybody, uh, especially the moderators, but everybody who participates and helps us put the show together by doing that. If you, yes, there are people who, you know, the money men, uh, the money men and women get to be co-executive producers because they pledge on the patron at a certain level. That's what that, that's what that title means. That means the people who gave the money to make the thing happen. But then there's the actual like line producers. You can call yourself a line producer of Daily Tech News Show if you're in there in the subreddit helping us figure out what to talk about every day. Captain Kipper is a line producer. He sent us this torrid freak story that Ola VPN sells users bandwidth to others through a service called Luminati. Uh, this has come to light, even though it was already in the light apparently, because an 8chan message board operator named Frederick Brennan claimed that Luminati was used to attack his website. Ola doesn't deny that. In fact, they don't deny any of it. Ola says it has, in fact, suspended the user that misused its service, and it would cooperate with any law enforcement activity related to the attacks. They're, they're sorry about it. They, they, they're like, look, any VPN provider could be used to do this. We, we're sorry it happened to him, but we've, we've stopped that account from using our service. Ola's FAQ also makes it clear that it does use bandwidth from Ola's customers when they are sitting idle, and the company defines idle as meaning the device is connected to power, not on battery, there is no mouse or keyboard activity, if the device is connected to an actual local network or Wi-Fi, not on cellular data, uh, and they say any user who isn't comfortable with this can buy Ola for $5 a month. But if you listen to ThreatWire, as Darren Kitchen pointed out this morning, uh, botnet could be another word for how this activity could be used. Right, yeah, we did go into this a little bit more in uh, ThreatWire, so check that out. Uh, it's another one of the shows we do at the Hack5 uh, warehouse. But, um, yeah, the interesting thing about this is there's a lot of money to be made in botnets. And this is a really interesting quasi-lawful way to go about it by providing a service and just having it parts of terms of service. And we've talked about this a bit before, about how it's really interesting the juxtaposition between being a citizen under the law versus being a user under the terms of service, and how corporations can kind of like, you know, come up with whatever they want as far as their rules. And it's, and it's you know, fair, it's their playground. But in this case, the playground is a lot different than you might expect if you're just installing this uh, very simple Chrome extension so that you can watch a geofenced football game where you otherwise wouldn't be able to use. Um, you know, the, the BBC iPlayer is the go-to example of like, oh, well, if you look like you're in Britain, then you can watch the BBC. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's great that uh, because of... Uh, VPN, or sorry, be because of geofencing, that more people have clued into VPNs, and VPNs can do a lot to protect people's privacy. So I guess that's the silver lining that it's good, but in this case, Hola is uh, a, a pretty terrible company. When you look at the Luminati brand that they run, which resells your bandwidth resources when your computer is idle, um, what it does is allows someone to pay money to use the, the aggregated user base of Hola to send HTTP posts to a single source. 
that's how they describe it. They've got a really pretty infographic that shows like your data, everybody's, all these users, one target. And there's, there's a term for that on the internet and it's called a distributed denial of service attack. In fact, they, they basically only allow you to do HTTP posts. So it only has one use case mm. and that's DDoS. There's yeah. really not another use case for this service. Um, so they claim that this is spelled out in their FAQ, which it is now, uh, but many have pointed out that FAQ was recently updated. How recently? Was it just as soon as you know, the, the 8chan DDoS got attention by the media? Um, so yeah, uh, although the, the other takeaway that I see here is, wow, what an interesting service. It's kind of like Tor in that um, you know everybody's sharing bandwidth and you're becoming a uh, you're becoming an exit node uh, by default uh, which means other people's traffic is passing through you there's another security risk in this that you're probably not considering where typically a VPN if you trust your VPN provider you're securing your traffic between you and it and then it goes out from their servers right and as long as you trust their servers then you're good but with their distributed free DNS sol uh, VPN solution all of your traffic is going through some random guy's connection. So as the security researcher, I'm kind of like, wow, I'm going to spin up a few of these in some virtual machines and just sniff all the insecure traffic coming out of them. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It, it, there's two points here. One is let's leave the Luminati service and the questions about its legitimacy aside. This is a really interesting technology if it is above board. And if you do say, folks, you need to be aware of a security issue here, but... In that case, it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, geolocation uh, fuzzer, right? And maybe that's not going to be uh, something that, that governments are going to want to allow or not. But it's a really interesting way to do this. It is not a secure way to do this at all. And it right. is not the kind of VPN that you should be using if you want to secure your traffic in a virtual private network. So any VPN service you buy, you need to make sure that you know that the, cost, that the company running it is, is trustworthy and has a good track record. Right. If I would feel very different um, about this service if there wasn't the Luminati DDoS selling botnet aspect of it. Um, and you're right, security notwithstanding, because you're not going to have that when you're aggregating your internet traffic through a network like that. I mean, you don't have that through Tor. If you run right. a Tor exit node, you see people's traffic. But not everybody does that. Um, and the people that do are a lot more privacy conscious, I would consider. I would feel very different if this service, something as easy to set up as this, it's like two clicks to get going, were uh, like an open source project or something like that. Right. And I feel like it's very much needed in this day and age because unfortunately, geofencing is being used more and more and it's not really, the internet wasn't built to prop up business models that rely on borders. So. Uh, similar to how we saw in New Zealand a few weeks back, uh, the laws about you know the the, the lawsuit with uh, the ISP there and uh, Netflix and saying like whoa you're offering a service that's going to allow people to pose as they're coming in from a different country than New Zealand and we want to be able to restrict who gets what where and I would love to see something like this used massively to the point where geofencing geolocation IP data is completely useless at propping up these models. You know, the internet doesn't work the way a lot of people think it works uh, when they want to make money off of it. For instance, Cairo 5976 sent us the Cult of Mac report that more than half of the founding artists of Jay-Z's Tidal music streaming service may have to pull their music from the site because Tidal has failed to reach a music licensing agreement with Sony. Among the artists affected are Taylor Swift's man, Calvin Harris, Alicia Keys, Daft Punk, Usher, and founder Jay-Z's wife, Beyonce. Uh, Jay-Z was apparently hoping a deal with Sprint was going to cover the cost of Sony's licensing terms, but Sprint has apparently decided that they are not in a, quote, financial investment uh, situation. Uh, so, yeah, I, <laughs> it, I don't want to get too much schadenfreude out of this because I thought it was a good thing to have title uh, in, the, in there, despite the miscue of promoting themselves as give the artist the money when they're all incredibly successful artists. More competition is better to me. However, uh, it's a lot more of a morass of licensing out there than you would think. And that's what Tidal is learning right now. And that's a look at the headlines.
All right, let's talk about Professor Kim Hung Kwang, and apologies uh, for my Korean pronunciation. Uh, he defected from the PDK uh, or the PDRK, yeah, the, the People's Democratic Republic of Korea, North Korea, in 2004. He taught computer science at Hamhung Computer Technology University for 20 years and says that many of his students went on to the infamous Bureau 121, which is allegedly a segment of hackers from North Korea who operate around the world, including out of the basement of a Korean restaurant in China or possibly a hotel in Shenyang. Uh, there's also the number 91 office in North Korea, which is hackers. Anyway, he claims to still be in contact with several influential people in North Korea with knowledge of cyber operations, says there are around 6,000 hackers in the Bureau 121 now, estimates that 10 to 20 percent of military budget spending in North Korea is done on online operations, and warns that their cyber attacks could have similar impacts as military attacks, killing people and destroying cities. Those are his words, killing people and destroying cities. He says, quote, a Stuxnet-style attack designed to destroy a city has been prepared by North Korea and is a feasible threat. Now, I'll give the BBC props for quoting journalist Martin Williams, who said, quote, I think it's important to underline that this is theoretical and possible from non-North Korean hackers, too. Uh, then Professor Kim went on to call for ICANN, the, uh, the folks who handled the domain name system, among other things, to ban North Korea if they are found guilty of this. Uh, and ICANN responded, ICANN does not have the power nor remit to ban countries from having a presence or access to the Internet. Uh, this is from Duncan Burns, its head of communications. Uh, meanwhile, if you want to get the North Korea uh, Internet offline, go to China Unicom and convince them to cut them off because that's the one connection that North Korea has to the Internet. Wow, that's a lot. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on there. So first of all, this idea. Uh, let, let's 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 go with the. Could North Korean hackers destroy a city? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on your concept of destroy. I mean, I feel like uh, you know, in this ever connected global economy kind of you know world that we live in, uh, war is very expensive. There's a lot of deterrence. Uh, to, to destroying cities uh, uh, in that you, you may not be around to see the, the next sunrise. Um, and so if what you're trying to achieve um, can be done in a different means that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, blowing up cities, then uh, cyber is probably your best way to go. I'd say bang for dollar, you know, you bang for buck, uh, a cyber army is, you know, leaps and bounds more effective than bombs and guns. Um, so it would make sense to put your money there if you're North Korea. Uh, but, um, but Okay, as far as so like they can do some city, damage, like, but what kind of damage can they do? Okay, so uh, we saw some kind of like hints to what can actually be done in the real world as everything is connected to a, a computer in one way or, or another. Um, with Stuxnet, the, uh, the worm that was uh, supposedly co-created... Um, between us and, um, and Iran, and um, I'm sorry, the Israelis, and we uh, used it to destroy uh, the PLCs that do uh, the centrifuges that enrich uranium, right? And it's because those programmable logic controllers, uh, they, you know, monitor equipment and they uh, execute commands telling them how to spin and whatnot, and it was a very uh, specialized worm specifically designed to uh, to destroy this piece of equipment by telling it to spin in a certain way that they knew it would damage it. But and it was passed by that from USB the stick, right? It was, it was it was not that these things were networked, but but the, there were some insecure USB sticks that this the, malware the delivery means piggybacked on. Were interesting, yes. Uh, something that I'm actually very familiar with uh, with uh, USB switch blades and the USB rubber duckies and things of that nature, but. Um, you know, the delivery mechanisms notwithstanding was, was interesting here is it was overriding the firmware on these, uh, on these very specialized pieces of equipment telling them, hey, go do something that we know is going to break you, but don't tell anyone. Don't set off those alarms. But they and didn't that's kind destroy of the part. a city. Yes, Even so Stuxnet think did. about that as it applies to all of the other things that manage, uh, you know, our water lines and our gas lines and our electrical grid and, and you know, as, um, you know, we, we think about it as consumers like, oh, smart meters, but we don't think about the back end, which is like making all of this happen. And so if the firmware of a lot of these, you know, devices can be overwritten in such a way that will cause harm and at the same time not... Uh, alert that there's anything 
happening, by the time you do find out that something went wrong, it might be a little too late. Sure. And, uh, you know, I don't feel like you're going to see, like, buildings blowing up and action heroes jumping out of windows and over helicopters. What you'll end up with is, like, power outages and water not flowing the way it needs to and maybe gas lines doing what gas lines do when things go wrong. Yeah, and Martin Williams makes a good point. It's not like a hacker from North Korea has is the only person in the world who can do this. So if you had to just guess and it's an it's an un it's an educated guess but it's it's an unscientific guess uh what do you think the likelihood is that the north korea could, could or would pull off something like that i think i personally think it's rather low you think it's rather what low okay um i think that the, uh, th uh, theoretically a lot of those you know th there's the possibility to wreak some havoc with computers yes um i think that if there's any nation state i would Put my money. Uh, I would rank North Korea number one as far as having the motive, um, and you know, technical skill can be learned by pretty much anyone. I mean, it's an equal playing field when it comes to this. It's not like you know, um, uh, nuclear uh, uh, proliferation. It's there's not uh, United Nations uh, councils, you know, um, that are uh, tasked with controlling the export and stuff and, and controlling the use of different technologies when it comes to this. You can do the same with a netbook that you can with, you know, to, the, to similar effect of like, you know, giant workstations and servers. So, um, as this far sort of as thing has been possible sure. for a long time, I guess is, is my point. Uh, and we right. don't and see it happening every day. It, it probably would have already. Yeah. Uh, on the other end of it, uh, asking ICANN to ban North Korea uh, shows a, a definite misunderstanding of how the internet works by Professor Kim because ICANN manages a domain name and sure, you can get rid of North Korea's domain name, but that does not take them off the internet. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about the internet is there's no centralized authority that are like, oh yeah, we're the internet company. Oh, turn off the internet? Sure, let me press the big red you button. You didn't pay your internet bill. We're turning yeah. your internet off. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And it's great that it's decentralized in that nature. It's what makes it so beautiful. I mean, when you think, I mean, the, the internet is just a network of networks, right? Yeah. Uh, and so whether your network is connected, I mean, they're not all connected. You know, sometimes there's just not a route, right? Um, but uh, the idea that I can, which just manages domain names, could say turn off a country is kind of, uh, it's a little crazy um, because the domain name has nothing to do with their connection to the internet. It just still work. That's why Doug and Bird said, we, we don't have the power. Like we, we can't turn, we can't do that. We, <laughs> we can turn off their domain name. He's like, we don't have the remit to do that either. We don't have the authorization, right? It's not our job to decide who gets to have a domain name or not. That's, that's a bigger question. But he's also like, even if we took away their domain name, uh, it doesn't keep them off the internet. In, in any way. China Unicom has the one pipe that connects North Korea to the rest of this interconnected network of networks that, that Darren's talking about. Uh, so really, if anybody has the, has the ability to take North Korea off the internet, it would be them. Right. And then that's the idea is you had your bets and you have multiple connections. Yeah. And, you know, as servers go down, as servers are wanting to do, you have a backup. Um, so yeah, if you have a single point of failure, there you go. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, yes, it's not ICANN's decision who gets to be on the internet any more than it is ICANN's decision who gets to be on the planet, right? You remove the internet from the equation, and really what we're talking about is connecting people. Right. Unfortunately, when you're talking about North Korea, it's uh, it's questionable how many people actually benefit from those connections. Uh, so I, I would I would hope that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights applies to the citizens of North Korea, but I, I unfortunately know otherwise. Yeah. Our pick of the day will cheer us up, though. Joel, the Uper DTNS Nickelbacker, he writes, for a long time I have drooled from afar at the world of home automation as the solutions were either too expensive or too complex for the whole family. Then I saw this on the shelf for 24 bucks. Link Starter Pack by GE. Comes with a Wink-based hub, 260-watt equivalent dimmable LED bulbs. I found it to be a great way to test out new tech trends without getting too invested because it's only $24. And if I do decide to go further, there's a bunch of compatible products. Uh, that's cool. He's got a link to it if you're interested. Uh, it is a bargain price uh, that they're offering there uh, yep. for something like this. And, and it's 
I think he's got the right approach, which is, hey, something for me to play around with. A couple of LED bulbs, see if I like it. Because you don't want to go too far in investing in this sort of thing when we really don't know what the standard's going to end up being. Right. And you know, what you're going to want to do when you get that is get yourself like an X stick or another uh, USB adapter that speaks Zigbee. Because uh, one of the reasons these are so cheap is because they, they speak that very lightweight protocol. Uh, Zigbee is, um, it doesn't get enough attention really, but it's basically like, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on a different frequency. Um, so it seems kind of hackable. And for 25 bucks, I might have to pick up a, a set of these and start hacking on them because it's a fun protocol. Thanks for the pick, Jill. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Folks, I want to hear from you. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Uh, we'll get through, through a few of these emails here. Uh, Toby Atticus Fraley uh, let us know that his Kickstarter has succeeded at the Pittsburgh International Airport. Well, he wants to put a robot repair shop in the Pittsburgh International Airport, and he got funded. So it'll be opening this September. Uh, as far as Toby knows, this is the first time a public art installation for the airport has been crowdsourced. And there will be a robot repair short shop if you're flying through Pittsburgh. It's kind of cool. Uh, Co-executive producer Damien from Gloomy Outside My Hospital Window, Maitland, Australia. I hope you get well soon then, uh, Damien said. When I heard about testing of Google Tone, I immediately cringed at the thought of the security implications. Did you hear about, did you read about Google Tone, Darren? Oh, that must have been when it was off grid. Oh no, I left. The world changed. It's not, uh, it's, it's not new. It's new from Google, but other people have done it before. You basically, if you're at a, a website, mm -hmm. and I always, uh, I always try to do this with dailytechnewsshow.com. If you're at a website, you, you can press this Chrome extension. It makes a tone. And then if you have another logged in instance of that same browser, uh, it will pop up, give you a pop-up saying, would you like to open that link? Uh, so Damien said, you made an offhand comment about malware bridging the air, air gap and oh. moved on, but I'm astounded that no one else seems to have made any other comments about the potential risks associated with the technology designed to bypass one of the fundamental security concepts that a standalone unconnected computer is unhackable. I realized that it is an optional extension. The user has to click to confirm the link being sent, but we know how easy it is to convince people to click on links that they shouldn't. Okay. Yes, no, all very good stuff. We actually used a very similar uh, technology in an air gap situation as kind of a thought exercise, really. Um, and that was to transfer data over um, acoustics, just free open in the air, very similar to the way that a modem works, but, you know, at a much lower baud rate, uh, something like 300 symbols per second is uh, what you can realistically achieve in a room uh, with some, you know, regular room noise. And, um, it's pretty cool. I didn't realize that there was an extension to do this, but that's what it is. It's just making tones that the other computer can recognize. And what it relies on is software on the other device, in this case a smartphone, constantly listening for those tones and accepting them and, and processing that data. So if your air-gapped machine isn't listening all the time for stuff, then you're probably fine. I would say that the best air-gapped machines uh, very much limit their input-output. Uh, I would say limit your output to only the monitor and limit your input to only the keyboard and mouse. Uh, so that means, you know, don't have speakers and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all of those other things that typically, you know, air gap machines are used to hold sensitive data. Uh, don't use anything that would allow unsensitive stuff to leave or is sensitive stuff to leave. I also, I, if I understand the Chrome extension correctly, uh, you, you really have to have it installed on your browser and be logged into Google. Uh, so I think you're at risk from a lot more things than somebody playing a tone that tricks your computer into giving a pop-up that you don't pay attention to and accidentally click and install malware. It's a fair point. Don't get me wrong. I'm not disparaging that. I think it's a little lower on the totem pole. And so if you're worried about it, just don't use this extension at all. Yeah, it's good stuff. Dave from Too Damn Sunny and Not Enough Rainy Los Angeles is an avid photographer and pointed out that in Google's new Photos app, uh, when he turned down the new feature to upload all his photos, the option for storage was high quality, unlimited storage, uh, great quality at reduced file size, and original, which was full resolution, 
that counted against your quota. So if you're excited about that unlimited, it's not going to be full quality. He says, my deduction from these descriptions is that unlimited storage will still be compressing your file to be smaller. And then Ted, who's a Lumia 1020 user, uh, which supports raw photo backups, did a little research himself and went uh, and said, I went to directly to Flickr and Google. Neither one supports raw at this time. Google limits your uploads to 75 megabytes per photo or 10 gigabytes per video. They also limit the resolution as well as does Flickr. So uh, if you are a serious photographer who shoots in raw or high resolution, you need to read the fine print on Google Photos. If you're just an amateur guy like me and doesn't care, then yeah, it's unlimited. It's good stuff. And Dwayne here from somewhere in the desert, which I cannot wait to leave, <laughs> says, you said you have never seen the sharing of photos with the link. I don't know if I said I'd never seen the sharing of photos with the link. I thought what I said was I'm excited to see Microsoft doing with this a link because we don't see it very often. But let's, let's say I said I never did. Uh, his point is Microsoft has been doing this for years. Microsoft has some good features like giving the sender rights to allow the receiver to just view, download, or edit time span that they have access, and it's all built into Outlook and OneDrive. So thanks for the tip. Good stuff. And thank you, Darren Kitchen, for joining us as always, my friend. Uh, it's great to have you back. We missed you, and uh, we're uh, very excited about what's going on with Hack5.org. As I've mentioned, I'm a big fan of, of ThreatWire, which, uh, Dar you know, I don't like to brag, but Darren uh, personally delivered today's episode to me so I could watch it immediately. It yes, nice it's, a, uh, it's a new, you know, option that we're thinking about implementing for our, our special patrons at a, a certain level. Uh, hand delivery, it's something you just won't find. You know, these are handcrafted podcasts. And, uh, you know, most of them are, are free range and uh, fair trade. Artisan, we try artisan. to keep them organic when possible. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, we appreciate good. You can find all of these free range podcasts at hak, the number 5.org. And that's where you'll find ThreatWire on security, privacy, and internet freedom. Metasploit Minute if you're interested in learning some of the best hacking frameworks. Hack Tip with Shannon, which goes into the basics of hacking, as well as Tech Thing with uh, Shannon Morse and Patrick Norton. It's your more general tech show. Of course, Hack Five. It's been around for ten years now, and we're just you know kicking it old school. And um, yeah, and we got an awesome show this week, all about 3D mapping using drones. So with just uh, a GoPro and a drone, you can create 3D models of uh, things on the ground. So we went out to the high seas and took photographs of uh, of uh, interesting installations in the bay. There you go for all your small batch. Artisan podcast needs, head to hak5.org. Len Peralta is an artisan. Yes. In a real sense, because uh, <laughs> he makes art. If I work on an artisanal, you know, you know, background here, and this is what I do. Um, no, this is uh, this is today's image. The uh, the image for today uh, was I was kind of taken by the fact that hackers could kill you. Which I thought, you know, you talked about it, and and Darren said that he doesn't think that it's going to be like, you know, guys fighting and stuff like that. But I like to think that it's going to be guys fighting. And so here's an image of. But what if it was <laughs> guys fighting? <laughs> what if it was? I think it would look a little like this. No, it's a. Uh, the image today is of a Korean hacker who looks a little bit like uh, uh, Sub Zero uh, from uh, from Mortal Kombat, battling our very own Darren Kitchen. With you looking on in fear in the background, of course, Tom. And it just I says, wish I, I wish I wasn't petrified, Darren. I'd help you out. Yes, <laughs> You're I, just I know. Shot. I know you've got you've got my back. <laughs> I, literally, that's all I have is a shocked Actually, look at your back. I think of it, Tom. Is that not the expression you're making in most of Len's art? <laughs> It's kind of the expression I'm making in most of my life. I'll be honest. It's you know it's you know maybe next I should have had you um, I should have had you faddling him too, Tom. I didn't even think. I think I'd... this is a, the problem is Len's going off photos of me, and all I ever do in a selfie photo that anyone makes me take <laughs> is that face. So <laughs> it should be your that. new avatar. <laughs> it's what it is. Yeah, maybe it should. Yeah. Uh, no, this is fantastic. Uh, I I I think Darren is going to prevail. I think we're seeing. You know, that point in the fight where it looks like our hero cannot win. Uh, but don't forget, Darren's gripping a pineapple here. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. going to play yeah. into the next move, I, I, I swear. I think what I'm going to go for is, is the medical device hacks. Because that's, that's where you can actually kill people, you know, like turn off the... the oh, yes. Yeah. That's All where this guy's got is a USB drive. Darren's not going to plug that in. Trust I don't me. know. I don't know. Pineapple versus USB drive. I mean, you know. Well, the USB drive is, is a little skull. 
So, oh, who knows? That's actually kind who of knows what's going don't, uh, don't underestimate the skull drive. <laughs> so, where can I find this fine art, Len Peralta? Well, you can go to lenperaltstore.com. Uh, you can purchase it right now. I, I just put up a new banner today. I've got some great prints in there, some great geeky pinups, including a mashup of uh, Immortan Joe and Beetlejuice called Beetle Joe, which is right there on the front page. I got some great prints of Black Widow, of um, uh, Imperi uh, Imperi uh, Furiosa. I keep on forgetting Imperiota. Furiosa. She's Imperator. Imperator. Furiosa. There That's you go. Furiosa. Title, yeah. Got a whole bunch of stuff there. Plus, if you want to get each one of these images uh, as a digital file, high-res digital file to put on your phone or maybe your background, go to my uh, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Back the DTNS lover level, you'll get each and every one of these as high-res files. Uh, it keeps uh, It's environmentally friendly. keeps me from having to print them out. And uh, you save a little bit, too. You'll get you get a better deal, I think. You do yeah. That, so. so go back that. Len, you never cease to amaze me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to our patrons, 5,049 people who are back in the show every month. They're like, look, I get enough value out of the show. I'm going to give you at least a dollar. So I'm giving more. Uh, you guys are the best. And uh, so are everybody who backs the show in any way that they can or want to. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support for all those ways. You can even find a DTNS mug there. Hmm. Drink some tasty coffee out of it. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. Listen to the show live at AlphaGeekRadio.com. Visit our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. And then come back Monday when we'll have Veronica Belmont on the show. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>